Heath McIver started puppeteering when he was 17 years old, and he's worked on everything from television shows such as Jim Henson's Me and My Monsters to arena spectaculars like Walking with Dinosaurs. His greatest claim to fame, though, may just be his own character, Randy Feltface, who has appeared in a countless number of theater festivals and on television shows around the world. I talked to Heath McIver about his career, Randy, and everything in between on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media, and now... Back to our show. Under the Puppet is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons. To support the show and hear new episodes before anyone else, become a patron. Visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media for more information. And thank you for your support. Welcome to the show that talks to puppeteers about the art and business of puppetry. My name is Grandpa Choco, and this is Under the Puppet. Welcome to Under the Puppet. Before we get to the interview, I want to give a special shout out to listeners Shuluzula and Sweetie Retro Girl who left reviews for Under the Puppet on Apple Podcasts. It's listener reviews like these, as well as your word of mouth, that help new listeners find the show, and it is very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Well, now let's get to the interview. This one was really big for me because I am a huge fan of my guest, Heath McIver. Heath has puppeteered on television and in movies, but it is the success he's had with his own character, Randy Feltface, that is to me really inspirational as a puppeteer and creator. Here now is my interview with Heath McIver. Heath McIver, welcome to Under the Puppet. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I'm so excited. I'm a huge fan of yours. Oh, well, thank you very much. And I'm excited to talk to you today. Um, but I will start as we always do. Uh, do you remember your first exposure to puppetry? Uh, yes. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, there was always puppets in the, you know, in my collection of soft toys and stuff. When I was a little kid, we had like, I had, I had a couple of glove puppets that I was really fond of and used to play with. But most, I mean, that's the physical form of puppets. But I, if, if I think about my first exposure to puppets, I think about the first puppets I saw on television, I think, where, where um, there was always a puppet in every show. Mm-hmm. Every kid's show had a puppet when I was growing up. We had, and I grew up in Australia, um, and there were some amazing shows that had puppets. A lot of suit puppets, Fat Cat, um, Humphrey B. Bear, uh, you won't know any of these shows. <laughs> Shirl's Neighborhood was this show with glove puppets. They were like, there was the crows living in the backyard of this. And it was, um, the host was a guy called Shirley Strawn, who is, who was in a band called The Skyhooks. I don't know if you've ever heard The Skyhooks, but look them up. Okay. Good seven, good Australian 70s rock and roll. Awesome. Um, yeah. And then there were shows like um, Mr. Squiggle, which was a guy, Norman Hetherington. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's yeah. an Australian puppeteer. He's a phenomenal puppeteer. He, he, um, he's no longer with us, but he was an amazing puppeteer, Mr. Squiggle. And, um, and then we had Play School, which was our kind of, which is still going, like our longest running children's education sort of, you know, every day of the week, singing songs to kids. And that's where I first saw Richard Bradshaw, who's an amazing shadow puppeteer from Australia. Look him up. He did an episode of Henson's World of Puppets. Do you remember that series? Yeah. 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 There's an episode with um, with uh, Richard Bradshaw. Um, I'm rambling now about shows that I used to watch. Let's keep going. And no, then, of course, great. Sesame Street and The Muppets. Obviously, I watch Sesame Street every day. Um, and The Muppets. I was obsessed with The Muppets. Um, Sooty Sweep and Sue was another oh, one. Yeah, yeah. I used to really dig. I guess it's those weird, like, subconscious puppets just... They just seep into your system. I think that's why puppetry works a lot of the time with adults is because we just we think puppets are normal as we're growing up. Maybe it doesn't happen as much now, but when when I grew up in the eighties and it was just there were puppets everywhere. Yeah. Every every kid's television show had a puppet sidekick. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um they've just always been like there. Just <laughs> right. lurking. Creepy puppets. We're used to them. Everywhere. <laughs> Indoct- um, we've been indoctrinated yes. by television to accept puppets as normal. <laughs> They're not normal. What we do is not normal. <laughs> well, that's if you're listening to this and you're a puppeteer, you're a freak. <laughs> you get a real job. Wait, my mom's here all of a sudden. Oh, hello. Um, were your parents creative? Yeah, I mean, they they both drive buses and they do it very well and they're wonderful humans. My parents are still alive, um, they're still together, still living in the same house I grew up in, in country Victoria, in Australia. And um, 
My dad was an amazing writer and poet. He used to write poetry all the time. My mum is an amazing gardener and they're both creative thinkers, um, but they weren't. They certainly don't work in the arts and never have. But, um, you know, a lot of books and a lot of, yeah. I, I, would, I would just, I don't know if they describe themselves as creative, right. but I look at them as both being very creative. My mum's an amazing cook and she's amazing. Like what she does in her garden is phenomenal. And my dad is, he makes things. He's always making and painting and creating things in his shed and, sorry, in his garden garage <laughs> and um yeah so i think of them i had a very creative childhood i had an older sister my sister's four years older than i am and her and i always used to make shows and kind of she was kind of my creative pal growing up she still is in fact is she still doing in the arts or yeah she has a radio show oh, and okay. uh and she also she didn't really go into performing she's in a band she's always been in the music side of things she um she's also moved into like gardening and stuff yeah there there's weird there's a yeah there's a big creative streak throughout my family but n- none of us are really i think I'm the only one that's on stage yeah yeah. Well, I was going to ask, it's interesting you mentioned uh, music, the music side of things, that um, a lot of your shows, and we'll get into talking about uh, the different shows you've done, but mm-hmm. um, there's singing involved. Mm. Did you study singing? No, I was just a singer in like metal bands, rock and roll <laughs> bands as a teenager. And yeah. then that kind of carried through into my 20s. And I was always in um, but bands, just singing in bands, not always screaming, but a lot of sort of, you know, country bands and stuff. And um And so I didn't really, I was always semi-confident with singing, but it wasn't until I started working with Sammy J, who's my comedy husband, and he and I, um, he's a musical comedian. So Mm. when we started working together, he brought the songs and we just started writing songs together. And so I think my singing kind of developed a lot more through that duo in terms of singing on stage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Now, I read two different things, so uh, correct me if this is wrong. I try to put as much (laughs) misinformation out there as possible. According to your bio, mm. it says that you, you first started your puppetry career at 17. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Mm-hmm. And, and what, what gig was that? What, how did that come about? It was a television series called Pig's Breakfast, which was uh, a series shot in Melbourne in Australia. I, was, I auditioned for it. Weirdly, I wasn't doing any puppetry. I wasn't, like, I wasn't you know, one of those puppeteers that came out of the womb with a puppet on my hand. Mm-hmm. I was never a maker, so I, I, but I was doing like theatre and stuff. I was always doing like... Um, we formed our own theatre companies and growing up in my teens doing shows all the time, stuff like that. And then my te- one of my teachers in my final year of school, uh, my teacher was my media studies teacher. He was also the theatre studies teacher, but I wasn't doing theatre studies. Anyway, this is getting boring already. No. Basically what happened was he put me up for this audition, which was a children's television series. It was a suit puppet character. His name was Grob. It was a giant alien. The The premise was two aliens crash land, two alien school children crash land at Channel 9 Studios. So Channel 9 was one of our free-to-air ch- channels in Australia. They crash at the studios and run onto the set of a children's television series, like a morning wacky kids TV show, on the same day that that children's television show has happened to book two suit characters two like actors in alien costumes they get mistaken for the actors right and uh befriend the two children on the show and they go undercover for the rest of the 52 episodes as uh actors in costumes hilarity ensues <laughs> so yeah i got that job um 17 i turned 18 very, very like at the same time as i got that job pretty much and finished my last year of school so i went straight into like a full-time television job as i was finishing my last year of school and then that's how i became a puppeteer wow so that's all you need to do to become a puppeteer <laughs> is to get cast a lead role in a children's television series at the age of 18 17 and then just do it for the rest of your life was it because you were um, you were younger then? There was just no fear, like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go do this. Yeah, I'll do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only doubt I had is when I got the job because I was going to study. I was going to go to university. I was going to become like a journalist, I think. And so when I actually got cast, I had this moment. I remember I sat down with two of my teachers, the media studies teacher and another teacher, and I was like, "What do I do? Like, am I?" <laughs> do I want to do this? And they were like, yes, you do. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I do. So it was a bit of a, there was the, it was a looking back. It was a definitive kind of moment because I haven't, 
I mean, I've done other stuff, but I haven't really ever. I've started calling myself a puppeteer then, and I have ever since. Mm-hmm. So now you mentioned that you're not a maker, but do you build puppets? Not really. Not really. Not really. I I enjoy building puppets, but I don't. I've never. I haven't done it enough to be very good at it. Mm-hmm. So I'll make if I'm doing a show. If I'm like, you know, I'll write a show and go, okay, I need this puppet. I'll just make it. But I won't make a really good looking puppet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's not to say my puppets are crap. The ones that I make, but they're not. I'm not a maker, and I work with so many amazing makers. Like I know so many phenomenal makers and I've been lucky enough to collaborate with them and perform with them. And it's like, if I want to make a puppet, I immediately see in my head who can make that puppet. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why would I even, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm exactly, I'm in the same exact boat as you. And it's, it's like, I would love to, like I've had moments where I've like, you know, got patterns and being all like, okay, I'm going to make a puppet. I'll get the foam and I get everything together and the, fleece and everything i'm like yes and then i'm like oh let's just just do something else for a minute and then it just never happens but um but i had until very recently i have a shipping container in my parents backyard uh that is full of my stuff because i'm of no fixed address and in there is the workshop that has followed me around for you know the last 15 years that has all the all the suitcases full of fabric and felt and foam and all of the, you know, the bits of wood for rods and armatures and steel and all the stuff, all the mechanisms in boxes and suitcases um, that I am now just shedding <laughs> like so much dead weight that's followed me around and just donating it to all these makers that I know. Yeah. So, yeah. To answer your question briefly, if you want to edit <laughs> this out, no, I'm not a maker. <laughs> Um, well, let me, let me ask you about, we're going to talk a lot about Randy, but, um, a lot of puppeteers have noticed that Randy's arm rods, yes. uh, kind of connect to the palm of his hand yes, they as, do. as opposed to the wrist. Yes. Was that your decision? Did you do that? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. But I, it's better. Yeah. Well, it's better for me. I, I look glove puppets are my thing, right? Mm-hmm. I love glove puppets. And if you give me a glovey, I'll just go for it. You know what I mean? But that position on the palm of the hand for Randy is just it's just him. It's like everything. All his movements are so. Uh, I'm so used to getting naturalistic movement and incidental movement out of his hands because of where those rods are. Yeah. I find if they're in, underneath or in that side bit of the what do you call that bit of your hand? Yeah, yeah, like the meat of your hand. Or the something. meat, yeah. the <laughs> underside. Um, if your thumb is up, um, that it's. Uh, I just you can't get those little sideways. It's just not as – it doesn't work for me. I still can do that and I'm happy with that. Right. But often those rods are designed to like come out, you know, yeah. his are bolted in and I go hard. Like his arms take a pounding, you know what I mean? He's <laughs> yeah. very um, – so but to answer your question, no, I didn't design that. A man named Philip Miller designed Randy and there's a name you should know. He's Philip amazing. Miller. Philip Miller, yeah. He's a um, – Puppet maker from Australia has a company called Puppet Vision. He works for CTC, Creature Technology. Okay, yeah. You know, you're walking with dinosaurs, King Kong, Train Your Dragon, Arena Spectaculars. He's a phenomenal maker. He made the puppet. He made Grob. He made the the first Um, character that I was in. mm -hmm. Um, I met him in that audition in 1998. And... and I've worked with him heaps. He's like my Yoda of puppetry. But his making is just mwah, exquisite. And he yeah. made Randy. Oh, I can tell you that story. We can talk about where <laughs> sure. Randy came from. Well, I mean, do you want to talk about the rods? Do you want no, to no, about- no. I was just asking. That was one of the things that uh, when I sort of put out a call that you were coming on the show, that was right. one of the questions somebody asked as a builder was like, why? Because they're in a different place. But, I but think, are well, they in a different place? Like who made that rule? The well, that's Muppets? true. The Muppets. <laughs> that's true. Is that yeah. the Muppets that made that rule? <laughs> Jim Henson himself. Henson was like, this is rod. where the rod goes. Yeah. No, yeah. but I, I, when we first saw your show down in Melbourne, mm. um, like you notice right away that the hands move differently and mm. it's really interesting, mm. you know? So that's, that's all why. I'm you know asking. what? It is tricky to get it right because you need enough play in them that there's enough space between the hand itself and whatever he's holding it in. So I usually have a lock nut there. Um, I have worn down 
uh, screws to the point of them snapping, like because of where it is. It's it. I very rarely replace them. Those hands, like those, it's once it's in, it's in. I have rods. I change the rods. I'll take it off and put a new rod on mm-hmm. if the rod starts to bend or get a bit. But I use like heavy gauge steel for my rods as well. That's the other thing. There's no bend in my rods. So if you look at you know your Kermits and stuff, they've got play in the rods and right. a lot of those, a lot of the puppet up puppets have got that same. Mm-hmm. All your Avenue Q puppets, they've got that play. You know, I don't have that. They're like he's rigid. He's a little robot. So that I didn't pick that place, but. If I'm working with a puppet maker to make a glove puppet, I'll often suggest that if the puppet needs to do stuff like that, like mm. what sort of things that Randy needs to do. But generally, if they're if they're rods that come in and out, there's such a it's a much neater, sexier place to hide the rod if it goes up through the meat of the hand. Um, there's no hiding the fact that Randy's got bolts. He's got like stigmata on his <laughs> hands. Um, but again, he was made so hastily for a completely different purpose. Right. Well, it was a corporate video, right? That's what yeah. he was made for. Well, yeah. not even a video. It was like a live show. A live show. Okay. Me and my friend Derek, um, God rest his soul. Derek's not dead. Um, Derek's <laughs> a good friend of mine. He, he and I made this show. So Derek, I met through Philip. Okay. Derek, Philip and I, well, Philip and Derek wrote a puppet comedy musical called Tyrannosaurus Sex, which was about, it was all about men's body issues. And the lead character was a penis named Bob. And then there was a whole lot of other puppets in it. There's a shot in my show reel <laughs> of a giant penis dinosaur. Yeah. That's from that show. I'll link it in the show notes so people can see it. It's <laughs> horrific. It's horrific. It's so awful. But that show was actually really cool. It was all songs. It was about Bob coming to terms with, you know, male body image and stuff. It was interesting at the time. I don't know if you get away with it now. It wasn't sexist or misogynistic in any way. It was actually quite a vulnerable show, but no one really wants to hear about men's issues at the moment probably. So, um, But anyway, hilariously, uh, Derek, Philip and I worked on that together and then Derek and I became quite good friends and we started collaborating on other projects and we he, he does corporate... Um, He's a consultant. He goes into workplaces and teaches about workplace bullying and sa- health and safety and creates, you know, training programs and stuff for big corporations. So he, we got given a chunk of change from this um, insurance company uh, in Australia to create a show about workplace bullying and we decided to use puppets and music. So we made this show called What's a Bully to You? And we made – we got Philip to make two puppets that Derek actually just sketched on a napkin and handed it to Philip and he went away and made them. And then we realized that we needed a third puppet at the last minute to play like a unisex role, to be like a, a, a female um, puppet in a call center, Beverly, and then a, like a male boy, like the guy who would deliver the mail to the office right. people. Um, and so Randy was made at the last minute with whatever Philip had left in the shed. So originally his rods... And maybe the reason they are where they are and the way that they are, how they are, is because... Um, actually you'll need to email Philip Miller to find out why he put them there. And I highly encourage everyone to spam him constantly. Going, <laughs> why did you put Randy's rods in his palm? He would love that. He would love that. Um, no, but, um, Randy's rods were originally barbecue forks. You know, the long forks, they're like the big long forks that you roast a marshmallow with or something. Right. And he just cut the, um, end off. Oh no! He yeah, he did. He sort of flattened out the end, and you know, drilled a hole in it, and then yeah, the end was like it was a barbecue utensil, and he was just made with whatever color paint Philip had in his. He was painted. He was like painted fabric. He wasn't wow. even dyed. Yeah. And if you look, there was one show. Sammy and I, Sammy J and I, we did a show called Sammy J and Randy in Bin Night. It was one of our live shows. And Randy was at the end of his life as a with that skin. He looks terrible. It's amazing. <laughs> and I didn't care. He was fine. But then I, yeah, I got him remade and blah, blah, blah. But that's the original, the original puppet, the original felt. No, the original foam, the original structure still exists. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's been recovered a couple of times. He's mm-hmm. pretty manky now. Like he doesn't quite look the same, but he's a double. And then recently this year, I just Antron fleece him up. I changed his fleece. 
So he was used to be this kind of skin fleece. I don't know if you've seen old photos of Randy from anywhere previous to this year. Yeah. He's got like um, this skin that um, I just was about to stop myself. And then I was like, no, this is what this podcast is about, isn't it? It's like yeah, nerdy, yeah. nerdy puppet stuff. Exactly. I'm like, I don't, no one <laughs> needs to hear what his skin is. But there's an amazing maker in Australia. Her name's Maria Fowler. She makes a lot of puppets for TV and film and stuff. I met her on the Henson series, actually, that I did called Me and My Monsters. And she has made a heap of my puppets since then. And she made this version of Randy for a, a TV show that I did with Randy and Sammy in Australia. And originally had the, he had this skin that she used for a pasta sauce commercial. She made these <laughs> puppets for this Dolmio t- tomato sauce puppets. And she used this It's a very, it's like full stretch, every direction, really... But you can't hide seams. So he always had this seam down the centre of his head and it was kind of part of his look. But anyway, this was about rods, wasn't it? I moved on to skin. <laughs> no, it's all good. Well, it was about uh, Randy's origin story. Origin. So that's came, what happened. So yeah. we did this show called What's a Bully to You? And it was great, but no one else thought it was great. And we did a run of it. We did a season of it. I, me and another puppeteer called Bruce Patterson. And Kira Lyons was another puppeteer on that. Awesome puppeteers from Australia. Um, <laughs> we did this horrific run of insurance company shows and they hated it, but we thought it was great. And anyway, at the end of that, I spent a lot more time in the wings with Randy. His name was Randy in that show, by the way. That's why he is called Randy because he, he was like, Randy was a good name for a male boy, mm-hmm. for like a guy who would deliver your mail. He was an easy person to bully. Um, not that Randy's a bullyable, <laughs> see if there's any Randy's listening. But um, everyone always goes, oh, a puppet called Randy, is it because he's Randy? I'm like, oh, yeah. No, it's just his name. Because Randy's not as, as common a name in Australia yeah. as it is here. So, yeah, everyone always thinks there's some sort of horrific sexual double entendre. <laughs> there's not. Anywho, um, yes, so uh, Randy was made for that. And uh, I started using him in the wings and making this horrific, bitter, twisted actor character that hated the world. And it was much funnier than the show. And then there was a puppet cabaret coming up um, that Philip was organising, Philip Miller was organising called um, Pure Puppet Palava. It was like a late night puppet cabaret show. Um, And Derek suggested that I write some stand up for that because I was always into comedy. And I went, okay. And then I started doing Randy. Were, um, to ask about the comedy, were you doing stand up just on your own? No, no. just you were you just liked it. Yeah, and I'd never. I was a big comedy fan, but I'd never done any stand up as me. And since I've only ever done it like five times without Randy. I did a gig last like a few weeks ago in New Orleans. I just got up at a open mic night. I was like, I need to do this more because taking him and something to hide behind to open mic nights to work up new material is a pain. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is um, when when you're on stage with Randy, you are always hidden, right? That's how Correct. that's what you wanted to how you want it to be. It's yeah. not like Avenue Q style where no. you could see you. Yeah, and that that infuriated me when I saw Avenue Q. Really, I hated that show so hard. I know there's going to yeah. be people going ah blasphemy. <laughs> no, no, no. But um, when I saw that show the first time, I saw it in New York. And I was furious at interval and I couldn't figure out why. And I was like, ah, oh, you just make a choice. Right. Is it a puppet show or is it a musical with humans? If it's a musical with humans, just put the puppets away. If it's a puppet show, let's see the puppets. And like when I saw Puppet Up and you guys go, whoop, Puppet Up, and you're like, yes, that's the height you hold a puppet. Let's do this, you know. <laughs> right. Um, plus, I just thought all the jokes in Avenue Q were not funny. <laughs> well, well, look, this is super controversial. You know what? I'm doing this just to annoy people because <laughs> I know how much people love that show. And when it came out, everyone was so excited for me to see it. Yeah. And I was like, I don't, I think that. It's just, it's very front of mind. So my big secret is I still have not seen it. Great. I have not Don't worry seen about it. it. Yeah. Is Gary Coleman still in it? You know what I mean? Like that joke dated within like a week yeah. and it was still going. My thing is I always just know like whenever they're casting for it, mm. they're like, oh, must sing well. We'll teach you how to puppeteer. Like it's, it's the puppetry is not important to that show. At least now. No, but nowadays. that surprised me because I've seen versions of it since or I've seen there was some exquisite puppetry moments in that show. Like there was like, there's this great moment where a huge version of a puppet appears over a building. There's like a big baby puppet. And I was like, that's awesome. And then there was this great moment where they go to bed and they had like, uh, you know, um, vertical beds on the stage and they Mm -hmm. would like pull the blanket up and they had like, really, there's some really neat puppetry in that show. 
Um, there, but there was only like one moment, I think, and the nerds listening can correct me on this, whether or not um, – uh, am I insulting your audience? No. Great. Nerds. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> uh, there's only like one or two moments where is it the – there's like the, the um, Cookie Monster-esque puppet tally whatever his name is what's the bat it's like a anyway there's I've a swarthy puppet he's a, he's a two-handed puppet so yeah. he's a glovey with two puppeteers and there's only like one moment in the show where you see him without the puppeteers i was like oh that's good i can focus on the puppet and not these you know gerbil faced actors enthusiastic <laughs> i'm holding a puppet faces yeah Please send all hate mail to heath at heathmciver.com. There you go, if uh, you want to get in touch. Um, talking about Randy, uh, Randy has, and maybe this developed in the wings of that show, he's mm. got this elaborate backstory where he's got an ex-wife and his career and all this. Um, was that there at the start, or did that just develop as you used him? That developed as I used him. He's, he, I started doing stand-up with him, and it was basically just, it's just me mm. talking with a puppet. So... He, I mean, as in talking my opinions through a puppet. And then I decided to write a full length hour long solo show for him called Randy's, excuse me, (laughs) called Randy's Postcards from Purgatory. And I needed a backstory for him. And I was going through a breakup at the time. And I thought it would be funny if he was a failed children's entertainer. So I wrote in a divorce for him. And I was drinking a lot at the time, I think. So I made him an alcoholic. So this alcoholic, out-of-work children's entertainer going through a divorce was kind of the premise of that show. And then we went back through his life, and I just invented it as I went. His yeah. backstory's changed about 10 times. Oh, really? Okay. Well, sort of. The ex-wife thing doesn't really ever come up anymore. Um, I will, if someone asks me in an interview what his backstory, or if you ask him what his backstory is, he'll just make up something on the spot. I just, I have a rule with him that I don't really answer I never give straight answers with him sort of thing. So he changes a lot. It, His yeah. backstory, that's probably from an old bio that was probably online somewhere. Well, and I just know on the on the TV show, uh, mm. he had he had a you know, his ex-wife. Ricketts Lane, of Rick course. Lane, that yeah. was that's he was he's an actor in that show. God, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah just as it. Sammy J is a lawyer in that show. <laughs> right. Randy has an ex wife. Yeah. Got it. So that's got that's it, yeah. yeah. So Randy's an actor. Okay. Well, um, you mentioned this, that, that, that Randy is sort of you, and you were just talking you know, through Randy. Mm. Do you ever get worried that if Randy says something outrageous, people are going to go, oh, that's how Heath really thinks about that situation? Does that ever worry you or not? Not, in, not at all, because it's a, as a comedian, you are, don't, it doesn't matter what comedian you are, you play a character on stage. Even if you're being the most honest version of yourself, you, you are... Um, you're talking, you're saying things in order to get a laugh and a reaction. So if people, if I say something on stage and people go, that's how he thinks and feels, it is. But I'm saying it, it's a comedic premise. It's a construct. So I'm not worried. I'm, if, I assume people will associate Randy's opinions with me because I write all of his jokes and I am the puppeteer doing it. So if he says something, I have to be able to walk out into the foyer after the show and address that with anyone who has an opinion about it. Right. And that's my role as a comedian. If you want to talk to me about the puppetry, again, I will, you know, same thing. It's not like, you know, yeah, it's the same thing. If you associate his movements and thoughts with me, that means that you understand how the show's working. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. So um, if you forget that there's a puppeteer underneath him, then that's the best thing I can ever achieve. Right. As a puppeteer. Yeah. You know. Well, and speaking of walking into the foyer, I wanted to ask you this. When we saw you in Melbourne and you came out into the lobby with uh, Sammy J mm-hmm. after the show to merchandise and all that kind of stuff, take oh, yeah. photos, yep. you were wearing a mask. Was I? Yeah. Right. Um, is, is that something, do you really, I know we kind of talked about a little bit about this before we went on, but is that something you try to keep you guys separate? You saw that show. I, we di- I did that for a lot of time with Sammy J because we were doing a lot of merch at that point. I mm-hmm. wore a balaclava, I think, maybe even. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I keep myself as as you know invisible as possible. I don't do photos with him. If I take photos with fans after show, or if I take a photo with someone on the street or anyone, I always hide. Like I'll hide behind the person, and Randy will be in the shot. Got it. Um, and so I don't really do that thing where I put a mask on for merch because it's just annoying. 
but I'll hide behind the merch table. I'll crouch down. And also, if I'm doing solo stuff with merch now, I kind of wait. I wait until the majority of people who have bought merch get sick of waiting for me to appear and then I'll appear and then I'll do photos and not in a jerky kind of way, <laughs> but just in a, um, I don't know. I only ever get people go, do you get a sore arm holding a puppet in the air for an hour? I don't. I get a sore arm holding my puppet at a right angle at a merchandise desk for two hours. Right. But I'm happy to do a show for 90 minutes with my arm straight up in the air, but it's that position that, that right angle, that, Avenue Q position, ironically, yeah, yeah. that I find like the next day I'm like, oh. Also, I have to swap arms with him a lot when I do merch because I'll usually take photos with my right hand, but I'll swap him to sign with my right hand. So if someone wants something signed, I use my right hand and he goes onto my left. Yeah. So I end up going Bleh, at the end of it. You you mentioned this, and I'm not going to ask you the question because you already a- answered it. Is is because when we saw you, there was a group of what six puppeteers, eight puppeteers. Mm-hmm. We're like, how did he keep his arm up the whole time? And you've already answered that. You can do you like doing it, but are you sitting on a rolly? Are you sitting on a chair underneath? I'm or? on my haunches. You're on your haunches. I'm crouched. Wow. Yeah, I crouch and I move a lot. So I kneel. I go between between kneeling and and crouching and, uh, um. I'll do it and you can describe it. All okay. Right, you ready? Ready? Sure. Here we go. Visual medium. All right. All so right. this is now commentary of how I operate a puppet. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, strap in. Grant, right. over to you in the studio. Yeah. Thank you, Heath. Uh, Heath is taking off his headphones and he is, uh, his arms straight up in the air, but he's kind of doing a little crab walk almost with his feet going back and forth. Perfect, beautiful movement with his crab walk. He's, he's on his haunches. That's what he's doing. We Just call it duck walking. Duck walking. You yes. call it crab walking. Sure. Well, you were going when side to side. Oh, the side, to side to side is a little walking. crab walking. Yeah, <gasps> that's a new term. I'm going to use that. <laughs> I don't know what I call that, but that's what I do underneath there. Now, let me ask you this: How do you make sure that you don't injure yourself while you're doing that? Is it just because you've done it for so long? It, it's natural, or yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, I do like stretch and I try to warm up, and um, I have an osteopath and a myotherapist, and I see it as physical theater. When, what I'm doing underneath him. Yeah. Yeah. That is such a wanky thing to say. But it's, <laughs> it's like, it's it's a... Uh, the, my only concern, particularly during shows, I've, I've never touched wood, got sort of injured during shows. I have like a few tweaks, like my back's a bit knackered and my... Knackered, that's an Australian term. <laughs> my back's a little shot and my right ankle is giving me some grief from constantly being like I'm always on that my ankles always kind of takes a lot of weight yeah on my right ankle so um yeah but apart from that it's like i see it as all i i'm trying to be comfortable and i try to be conscious of not being in one position for too long but i just always see in my head what he looks like so i don't use a monitor live um i'll use a monitor for tv stuff obviously mm-hmm. but um but I can just see what he looks like. So whatever position I get my body in, it's designed to make him look good. Yeah. So I don't really think about it during shows. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you mentioned you don't use a monitor. There are several times um, where you're talking directly to the audience. Mm. How do you... Is that just sound? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just where is that person coming from? Yeah. Yeah. And hope that you're hitting... Generally, I will start audience interaction by pointing him in a direction going, what's your name? And if someone answers straight away, I know I'm looking at them. If no one answers, I just move him a bit and I get a joke out of it. Like, am I looking at anybody? Right. And then I'll, if I find someone and they interact, or that's how I'll find someone to start with, and then I'll try to go back to the same place if I f- figure out where they are. I don't always get it right, and that's okay because it's comedy. Right. It's, you know, it's funny. Yeah. But if someone says something in the audience and I pinpoint them, and I get it right, it's like, Mwah, it's great. Because <laughs> they go, Ugh, you know. But, um, yeah, I don't, ha- it's, I don't have time for a monitor so- on stage. Like, there's no, why, you know, what am I, there's no point to having a monitor on stage to me. It's like, it would be, I'd have to have a camera everywhere I go. I'd have to have, you know, yeah. people go, have you got cameras in it? Is it are his pupils cameras? <laughs> like that? Why would that would be so heavy and annoying? Yeah. Like he's just a puppet. He's just a puppet, and it's like 
uh, that's not the point. If I don't look at someone, it doesn't matter, you know. Can you tell us a bit about Sammy J and the Forest of Dreams? Sammy J and the Forest of Dreams was a musical for with for adults with puppets. That um, so Sammy and I met on the comedy scene. He's a musical comedian. I was doing stand up with Randy. He was doing his musical comedy. We did a few gigs together. Just like happened to be on the same bill. And then there was this late night at the Butterfly Club. There was this late night show. It was called The Wrong Night. It was a show where comedians could do their most offensive material. And they booked me for that, but they said, because it's at a cabaret venue, you need to have some sort of cabaret element. So I got Sammy's number and called him and said, can you, because he was hosting, mm-hmm. he was hosting that show that night. I said, can you just accompany me on piano? And he started and I just ditched all my material and we started like riffing. And the owner of the club um, after the show was like, that was really great. You guys are really great on stage together. Sammy had a season coming up at that club that he had written nothing for. So he said, do you want to come over and we'll write together? And I went, sure. And we just, saw, you know, just to try it out. And we started laughing immediately and haven't really stopped since. Mm-hmm. And then I went on tour with Walking with Dinosaurs, the arena spectacular here in the States. Uh, I did six months of it in Australia and then I came and I was doing, doing it in the States. And after about three months, I was just over it. It was a great, an amazing show, but I wasn't, I was just sort of, it was like, you know, overnight. This is a long way of getting to this story, but you can cut this. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we were doing like this arena tour. We'd fly in and do a show in an arena in wherever the hell and then pack up and the trucks would go and we'd fly to the next place and do it the next night. And I was just, it was just not my jam. Animatronics are amazing, but I started to get bored with working in a life-size dinosaur. <laughs> and I'm like, this is, what? how can I be bored doing this? This is the best job ever. And then Sammy called me and said, I've got an idea for a musical. Um, and he'd been, he'd been drawing sketches of himself, like operating puppets with on broom handles with his feet, not even going, oh, I've just spent the last three years working with a puppeteer. <laughs> and called me and said, what are you doing? Do you want to do this musical for the comedy festival in Australia, in Melbourne? And I went, yep. And I just left Dinosaurs and flew home and we made the show. So it was a show about Sammy J. This is where you can pick up. If you want to cut out the backstory. Sure. Sammy J in the Forest of Dreams was a show about Sammy J finding a magical porthole in his kitchen cupboard and going through into this magical world where that was filled with puppets. There was God, there was like seventeen puppets in the show or something. I was the only puppeteer and I've just played multiple characters, often two at a time, and um Sammy basically the show opens with it the the opening song in the show and you can bleep this out is called fuck you disney and it was all about how um sammy was disenchanted disenfranchised disheartened by he he thought his life was going to be a disney disney movie and it and it turned out to be not yeah and then he got sucked into this magical forest full of these creatures well and that was uh you mentioned that show did the melbourne comedy festival Mm -hmm. it went to edinburgh Mm. um was that sort of like your like a little bit of a gateway drug of like, hey, I could create a show like this for Randy and do these things? Kind of. Well, Sammy had already done a bunch of solo sh- or maybe three solo shows, full full length solo shows. In the in the comedy world, particularly in Australia and the UK, you write a new hour and then you do the festivals every year, pretty much. And he'd done that, and I'd only really been doing spots with Randy. And then Forest of Dreams was absolutely a gateway drug into the full festival circuit. Mm-hmm. So, because we that show was like really cult, kind of took off. It got nominated for well, won awards and things, and it was just um, it was so stupid and irreverent. And the songs were great. Like it's got really Sammy wrote some really amazing music for that show. We wrote the whole thing together. We were super enthusiastic, super organized. The puppets were made by a guy called Leighton Young, who's an amazing puppet maker. And then, yeah, from there, I was like, this is this is what I want to do. I yeah. Want to, I want to do this for ages. So then, yeah, I wrote rant, rant, Postcards from Purgatory was 2009, I think. And then, yeah, I've done a solo show pretty much every year since. Yeah. Um, when you are doing a solo show and you write a new hour uh, kind of thing... Are you able to go out and try out this material or do you just write out the hour and then hope that it's funny <laughs> the first show? Or, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, a bit of a combination of both. Okay. So uh, it, most of my solo shows have some sort of narrative drive and they have a good 20 minutes of kind of um, theory and some bits that are kind of a bit more heartfelt or 
a bit more kind of introspective or existential or whatever, esoteric, whatever word you want to use. And so those bits, I don't really ever, I don't do those bits at comedy clubs. But the other bits, every show I write, I need at least half an hour of stuff that I can do on the road, you know, so I have to try that stuff out. But historically, I've sat down and written an hour or my process is I sit down, I write probably about two hours and then I trim it down and trim it down and trim it down and trim it down to probably 50 minutes and then I add jokes and then I trim it again and then I add more jokes, basically. It can never have, you know, too many jokes. Yeah. And then you put it in front of an audience and go, oh, that's, that's not where the laugh is. I was so wrong about that. It's yeah. this bit, you know, such a different thing. But then recently I, I've started just like working up more material on stage. So I'll have an idea and I'll just put it in front of an audience and, and riff on it until I find the... I improvise a lot in my live shows with the audience mostly. Do you uh, record your shows so you can listen back to them and that yeah, kind of stuff? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, just audio or video? Just, no, just audio. Just audio, yeah. Yeah, Because yeah. yeah. the moves change. You know, I don't want to get hooked on a move. If I get... It's funny with the rhythm of a joke, you'll find a comedian will hit the same rhythm and do like the same hand gesture f- every time. Some are like that with Randy. Yeah. But it's funny to me if he... It's more entertaining for me if he does something unexpected. Like for me. Like if I, I'll look up at him and he'll just like, you know, wipe something off his mouth or like <laughs> I, he often brushes something off his desk. <laughs> right. Yeah. Things like that and like or adjust his shirt or, you know, just do little things with his hands. It's all so weirdly second nature. <laughs> I don't, yeah, anyway, whatever. Well, in 2015, you and Sammy J, and we kind of mentioned this before, got to, I, mean, I think this is so awesome, is that you got to do a TV show. Yeah. And um, how, how did that come about? How, were, were you just approached and they were like, hey, we want you to make a show? No, we pitched that show for five years. Well, oh, wow. Basically, yeah. yeah. Okay. We, we had an idea. We wrote a live show called Ricketts Lane mm-hmm. in 2010. And that show, it, it won Best Comedy at Melbourne Comedy Festival and we took it to Edinburgh and we took it around the place. And the whole idea of doing that show was to prove the concept because we wanted to make a TV show. Yeah. So we had a five-year plan. We were like, if we don't make a show in five years, we'll do, try something else. But Ricketts Lane was kind of like the premise and then all the other duo shows. Because that was the first Sammy J and Randy show okay. together, like our first hour together. Yeah. We did Forest of Dreams and we'd done heaps of hours together that were like songs and sketches and like bits of stand-up but we'd never written a narrative show together so Ricketts Lane was that and then Sammy was playing a lawyer Randy was his bum housemate and they and Sammy um had to prosecute Randy for tax fraud that was the premise of that show housemates odd couple blah 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 and we did that show to show television executives what it looked like. And then we started writing scripts and then it was, yeah, five years of development and bouncing back and forth with networks and different producers. And until we finally got to a point where they were like, yeah, let's, let's make it. Yeah. And then we worked our butts off and it was only six episodes. Yeah. And it's a really niche little kind of, I mean, I love it. I, I haven't watched it. I, there were there, you know, you watch it back and go, I do different stuff. There were jokes that we lost that I'd love to put back in, but as far as the, as the puppetry goes, there's some I love. There's some really cool bits. We did it all in camera. There's only one shot in the whole series where we, um, like wiped me out in post, where we deleted me in post. Where Randy's, it's like a wide shot, and you see his legs. He's sitting at a table. Sammy's mm-hmm. across from him, and I'm clearly under him. But we wiped. We you know shot a plate and cut me out of it. The rest of it's all in camera. So there's like some like I'm. You know that haunches, the crab walk thing? <laughs> yeah. Because we shot it all on location. So there's no studios. There's no trenches. Right. Okay. So like yeah. s- there was, there's one shot. There's a song that we did this, the, about the census coming. And I had to walk from the front door through the lounge room, through like the, the living room, into the kitchen singing this song with next to Sammy the whole way. And it's quite a wide shot. And the, I've never had to get that low <laughs> and move at the same time without a rolly. Like I duck walk the whole thing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was great. Yeah, it's a great show. Um, I was able, because I have a region-free player, so I was able oh, to great. pick it up on DVD, and it's it's really great. And it's um, it's just really inspiring, as I said, to oh. create a character and then have a TV show made. Is, it is, was so much fun. And was there, did, would you, 
was it always supposed to be six episodes or was it, did you want to go more? No, no, we, we had a second season okay. lined up and then there was a hot, I mean, I could bore you with that story, but it didn't work out. Basically, we, we would commission for a second series and the funding got pulled. And so then since then we've written, um, we've pitched maybe three different series. The most recent series that we had, that we have in development, but it's not, I mean, it's sort of gone cold. On the died on the vine, I think is the term used. Yeah. Um, as a series, uh, uh, this is exclusive. We've never spoken about this publicly, but it's a show called Truck Stop, where Sammy and Randy um, are working in a like a truck stop in the middle of the desert together. And uh, and yeah, it's not. It's not. It's sort of like f- we wrote a whole bunch of different ideas picking up off the back of Ricketts Lane. There was it, it's Ricketts Lane was supposed to be three seasons in a movie. That was our three seasons in a movie. That <laughs> right. was our whole thing with that. Yeah. And then, yeah, it just didn't work out, which happens in television. And we, I was pretty bitter about it, to be honest. Really? Just, yeah. Well, for a minute, you know, because it was green lit. There was like a champagne bottle in the calendar. Like, yeah, this is the day that we get to make series two. And then they went, oh, no, you know, you, you're not doing that anymore. And then I was like, oh, crap. And then I auditioned for Prometheus. As an alien. Yeah. And didn't get that. And then I went to hospital for six weeks. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of Prometheus, no. <laughs> that's the that's just my that's my story. How do you well, how do you deal with that? Because I mean as performers we deal with that all the time of like something's gonna happen. You could even By be the like way, the- I had like a I was sick. I didn't like go to hospital. <laughs> I didn't go to like a sanitarium to recover from the shock of not getting Prometheus. Um, uh, how do I? So how do you deal with well, not, yeah, rejection? Yeah, things. Yeah, reject. Well, and things not working out the way you think that they're going to work out, and which I guess is rejection. But yeah, <sighs> do you throw yourself in a creative? St- you right have to things? have things going all the time. Like, yeah. If you want to work in television, you have to have like eight projects on the go at once. And if you want to work in theater you have to have more than one idea and you have to be willing to change it. That's yeah. my experience. Because, and also collaboration is so important because as a solo performer, you can get pretty isolated. You know, as a comedian, like I'm lucky that I'm a puppeteer. I get to do like, I'll do a TV commercial or I'll do a children's series or I'll do something else with puppets. I get to hang out with other people. I can always call Sammy up and we can do some shows together. And I'm making a new show at the moment, which is like a physical theater show that has puppetry in it. And you just have to have like eight things going at once. So when you have those moments of rejection, it sucks if you've got a lot invested in it. And if you have an expectation that things are going to work out, of course it sucks. It's like a relationship that ends. It's like you have to mourn it. But I don't think I ever want to be in a position where I'm like, well, now what do I do? Right. It's like, oh, you do one of the eight other things that you (laughs) wanted to do, you know? And, um, and even with like ideas for ideas for Randy for what he does next, you know, because I'd love to do a lot more stuff over here. Like my whole plan to come here is to I want to work on Sesame Street. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that's that's like why not? You know? Right. So um, that's still every puppeteer's goal, right? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that's my dream too. Why not? So yeah. I'll bring Randy over here. I'll do gigs with Randy, but I'm just using him. <laughs> to get to get to, to get to, to get Sesame, to Street. Sesame Street, yeah. yeah. You perform with Randy a lot in live spaces, live theater shows, mm-hmm. um, and then but then you also did this TV show. What what changes about your style when you move him in front of a camera, or is he exactly the same? He's m- more refined on camera mm-hmm. because you can, you, I can see his subtle movements. I do all his subtle movements on stage, but I started glove puppet. I started working with glove puppets on screen. So uh, I'm I to me the I'm my happy place is looking at a puppet on a monitor and seeing what it, what it can do and it, what its eye line is in relation to other characters how you can enter and exit frame there's mm-hmm. just it's just comedy gold and just beautiful stuff so the difference with doing television with Randy is that he uh, you can do anything you can put him anywhere in the room with stage i'm locked i'm i'm locked i've got like a meter to work with or like you know whatever that is in feet or 3 feet yeah 3 3 and a <laughs> half maybe 1.5 is about as wide as i'll go with a playboard usually i just use an ironing board by the way oh really here's a here's a tip <laughs> 
If you want to do puppet shows, I have an ironing board uh, draped in black fabric and I just put two... I'm using drumsticks at the moment for wings. So I, I cable tie, zip tie, drumsticks onto the end of an ironing board and then I just gaffer tape wow. fabric onto it. And I do that because every hotel room has an ironing board. Every <laughs> theatre has an ironing board. They cost 20 bucks at Kmart or Wal- Mall Greens or Walmart or whatever. So I roll into town. If the hotel room doesn't have one, I just go get one. Um, and you bring your own fabric? I bring my own fabric. Yeah. Yeah, I bring fabric, gaffer tape, cable ties. Don't ever try to take gaffer tape and zip ties on as carry-on. <laughs> they, they frown upon that. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so the difference is that um, with being on camera with Randy is that at, or with any puppet is that anything's achievable. Because yeah. you can and, – and the subtle movements are just so much more fun to explore. Whereas live, he's got to have – I, I have to work with a room. I've got to, f- right. I've got to feel it. I, you know, the audience dictates how their room feels. So you have to, you know, it's not like doing a theater show. You go out and you do, you sh- you do the lines and you hit your marks and, but same with puppet up. Like the audience is giving you the feeds, right? If mm-hmm. they suck, you've got to, you've got to build the, momentum if they're like yeah you're like great this is going to be fun yeah, you know? it's easy it's yeah. easy you know and so uh randy's energy has to either match the audience or surpass it to kind of but on camera it's like i just get to he gets to be still and say what he needs to say and move in the way he needs to move yeah i don't need to do any gratuitous flailing to get the energy up on camera you you're know? not trying to reach that person in the back row when you're on exactly television. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Well, and one other question I wanted to ask about um, your work with Sammy J mm. is what do you feel is um, important about uh, maintaining a perfect creative relationship with somebody? So being able to work with them and the, be- the, the, mm, the most important thing about maintaining a perfect creative relationship is to celebrate its imperfection. So Sammy and I, I I count myself insanely lucky to work with Sammy. Our our both our work ethic and our energy, our sense of humor, our aesthetic collides in such a special way that it it's just you take it for granted when you work with other people. Sometimes you're like, well, no, it's just because you know we have such a shorthand. We're mm-hmm. so quick at writing together. We've never had an argument. Fifteen years, whatever, working together, we've had like two moments of like. That's annoying. And we've annoyed each other, but we just, I don't know how to answer that question. It's like going, how do you make a marriage work? Will <laughs> right. you meet someone who's not an idiot and you, and you, um, and you appreciate them and you respect them and you, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, uh, sometimes creative, you know, bands who hate each other make amazing music. But I, so I guess it works like that, but it's not sustainable. Right. So it's just, uh, and wor- and always have an open relationship with your creative partners, I think. Yeah. Because one of the best things about Sammy's and I, I think one of the things I value most is that we celebrate each other's solo victories. There's no weirdness. It's like, I've got this opportunity. Great. Go for it. Do this. You know, we just, we'll continue to work together. Everyone thinks we've broken up, <laughs> but he's right. doing TV in Australia at the moment and I'm, I'm here trying, yeah. trying to get on Sesame Street. <laughs> well, um, let me ask you, Randy Writes a Novel was mm-hmm. um, kind of your most recent show, right? You, you had well, one You had one after, right? Because you have one yeah. coming out on DVD. I've had like two since. since yeah. Oh, two since. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I, no, you wouldn't have seen them. They've never been shown on the television. Well, and you, you have a DVD of, uh, of Randy, Randy Writes, Writes a, a Novel. novel. Yeah. And how many shows did you film for that DVD? Is that just one so, single show? Yes, yeah, because you had done it so many times before that, it was... Yeah, I'm trying to remember the chronology, but I had done it, uh, I'd certainly done it in Edinburgh. I don't know if I'd done it in New York yet, 2017. Maybe not, I don't know. I can't remember when I shot it. I think I shot it in 2017 and then I took it to New York Okay. the next year. year. Um, it's cha- It changed a bit. Or maybe I shot it... Up. No, I definitely shot it before New York, I think. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's yeah. Yeah, I should. Uh, was a single show, one single night. Single show, that's one amazing. Night, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's really fantastic. But I'd done that show. I'd done it all around Australia. It evolved over two years. You know, I did a full run in Edinburgh. But like the story at the end and all that stuff was was from the very first draft kind of thing. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, let me ask you this because you you the bookshelf story. Yes. Uh, somebody put it on YouTube. Yes. It has 2.6 million views on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, it got put on a recommended list, I think. Like, YouTube recommended yeah. it to people. But do you? is there any part of you where that's like, I want those 2.6 million people to buy my DVD? Or where you're like, this is the greatest promotion I could have? The second one. Yeah. Because when it first went up, I was like, I should probably take that down because I haven't released it yet. And also, it was on, the, it was on television in Australia. It oh, okay. It was on ABC. It was on iView, which is like the streaming platform. That's where they ripped it from. You can see there's a watermark, a little logo in the corner. That's the network. It's the an network, Australian network. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when that went up, uh, I went, I'm just going to let this sit for a minute and see what responses it gets before you rip it down. The person that put it up didn't put an ad on it. It's not monetized for them. They've probably got a million subscribers now for their YouTube channel, but um, good on them, really. But um, if it had have been monetized, I would have take an umbrage i think probably and gone well hang on i appreciate the views but why are you making money off it and i'm not right but then i was like okay well <clears throat> i've got it on dvd if people really want a copy of it for themselves the hardcore fans can go to my website buy a copy um and you can't how do you reach that many people right yeah. and then someone pulled the, ripped the whole show and put the whole show up and now that's had a million views or whatever it's like that's great yeah and that's that single action that person stealing that Morgan story, I'll use the word stealing, but <laughs> taking that Morgan story and putting it online has pretty much broken me in America. It's yeah, just... I came across it. I, you know, I, had, I have known you before and seen you before, but I came across it and was like, I watched it five times <laughs> right, right away because it was just so hilarious and so funny. Well, yeah. the, weird, the only thing I thought when it went up was I was like, oh, that kills. That's the whole, like it's the end of the show. It's the reveal. Yeah. Like the whole, my whole, that whole hour is constructed for that last five-minute reveal where the Morgan story is the whole point of the bookshelf story is to is to prove the concept of stories and how you invest in them and how important they are and whether or not art is only art once it's been witnessed. Does it have to be true to be real? Is that, all of that was the whole basis. And they just took that bit and went, this is the end of the show. <laughs> and then so that was the only thing when I first watched it. I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah. You've ruined the ending. And then it's like turning to the back of the book. <laughs> but then I thought for, I reckon, three seconds and went, well, let's see how many people watch it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, because I looked last night uh, when I was finalizing the questions here, and that the whole show has like 2.5 million. Oh, you wow. Know? Like it's, really? it's almost That's to cool. the same amount. So. That's lovely. That's yeah. great. Because, yeah. yes, I could monetize that. And if I had have charged a dollar a view, I would have got <laughs> $2.5 million. But. But that's not really how it works. Right. Because someone, you know, $100 in, someone would have ripped it anyway. Right, right exactly. But yeah. the funny thing is I've got a special in a can right now called The Book of Randicus, which I filmed earlier this year. And I really like it. It's nearly, it's about to get color graded. It's like, it sounds great. It looks really cool. And I'm looking for an acquisition for that at the moment. It's not shot in high enough def to, to sell it to Netflix or anything. But um, so hopefully... If I put that online for a dollar, I'll get people will some people it. will want it. Yeah. Know? So that's the plan there. So yeah. it's like that someone else ripping it is an investment in my future. And I think that's something I learned early is you can't pick the order of your successes and you can't necessarily um I've there's been times in my past where I've worked on things like where I was like a high not I wouldn't say I was like no, I was like self-righteous at times in my early 20s around puppetry and stuff. You know, like you get a bit... Right. And there were certain times where I, I look back and go, you should have just shut up and let that play out. And that's where I'm at now. I'm like, oh, let's just see what happens. Yeah. Also, I think it's very punk to steal a show and put it on the internet and <laughs> see what happens. I don't, you know, go for it. Yeah. Steal content. <laughs> well, um, as we're wrapping up here, I did want to ask about, because um, part of the reason I think you're here in the States is Bring the Funny, the, yes. the TV show you're on. And I don't know how much you can talk about or say, but... All of it. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you the winner, because right. that hasn't been on yet. We, I have talked to other puppeteers who've been on this show, mm -hmm. um, who have gone on these kind of competition shows, mm -hmm. these reality competition shows. Mm -hmm. And 
a lot of times uh, the experience is not pleasant, and people say, and and I can I went on with a puppet character on America's Got Talent, got buzzed immediately, didn't even get to do anything. Like yeah. I walked out on stage, got buzzed, and I was like, I would not do this again. But was you? How was your experience with this show? I mean, I know you don't want to trash them, but uh, no, no, no. Was well, it fir- firstly, I would say if you want to do a reality television show and you go into it thinking it's going to be a positive and enjoyable experience, you're that you're misguided. Like, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, because yeah. that's the nature of those shows. They're horrific. They're gladiatorial, um, manipulative, uh, so heavily edited. Like if you think any of those reality shows are real, they're not, they shoot the backstory stuff they shoot with you is hours and hours of footage of you saying 800 things about your experience so far, all the other contestants, your childhood, your sick mum, whatever you talk about. And then they go, oh, yeah, great. That's great. Can you just say this one little bit? And then they'll just use that one little bit. Right. You know, so there's it's all so heavily edited and stuff. My experience on Bring the Funny was immensely positive because I was just – everyone who worked on it all the all the comedians that worked on it have had some experience, like at varying levels. But people are all, they're all working comics mostly, um, and sketch groups and whatever. So everybody kind of knew their thing. Everybody had their character. Everybody had their vibe down. It wasn't um, no one was particularly green. So everybody kind of was pretty chilled, I think. But the actual what got me was the the reality television side of it is very stressful. So mm-hmm. the 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 environment they create with that backstory stuff and like this idea that you're competing and God, God is you're going to get through to the next round. And it's horrible. It's horrible stuff. Yeah. And it's psychologically, it's really full on, but um, I loved it. I've said no to America's got talent and Australia's got talent and those shows just because. <sighs> okay. So the reason I left bring the funny was I got, there was a comedy clash and I got knocked out by a magician, a comedy magician called Jared Fell. He's Mm -hmm. from New Zealand. Good friend of mine, beautiful dude, very talented, amazing magician. His acts are brilliant. My act is so different, but we were put together. We're clashing, right? And so when, when you start comparing art forms that are so different, people have to pick one that they like and one that they hate. You can't, that's just how our brains work as an audience, unfortunately. So, it's like you're either the winner or you're the loser rather than these are two cool things right. that are happening. So with America's Got Talent, you got buzzed because they're like, okay, we've seen a puppet. It doesn't matter how good you are. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. we don't have a troop of acrobats that throw knives at each other's heads while singing opera. <laughs> right. Keep them in. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's no, <laughs> it's just, we, if we've seen it, we don't need to see it again kind of thing. Right. Um, and when you're compared to different things, like I don't want to go on, America's got talent because I don't want to be judged next to a dog jumping through a hoop. Yeah. Cause that's amazing. Look at the dog <laughs> jumping through a hoop and look, Oh, he's a really good puppeteer, but we exist in completely different universes. Right. Whereas bring the funny was all comedians. But right. again, I'm a puppet puppeteer doing comedy and he's a magician. They're different, but we have to compare them. And one has to win. It's right. just a, it's a horrible thing. Yeah. But one last point I'll make about that is that, the reason I did that show was was tactical. So I had this YouTube thing that happened. I didn't have management. I was managing myself and loving it. I was touring. I don't have any um, responsibility. I've got no house. I've got no wife. I've got no kids. I can up and move. I want to break into the States. I get a call going, do you want to do this show? I'm like, well, that seems like the right timing to get at least one or two three-minute bits of my stand-up material on national television in America mm-hmm. and a visa, you know, for the time that I'm working on that show. Right. So it's that to me wasn't about – It's not. this isn't me being cynical. It's about that's part of my plan. Right. So I have a career path that I already want. It'll change constantly. Mm-hmm. But you have goals and it's like, well, that – that works perfectly. That for gets that me goal. farther along yeah. to that goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's totally. Yeah. So I went in knowing that. I went in going, no matter what happens, a million or two million, maybe three million people are going to see another clip of my comedy. And being in LA, I'll get to meet with a few people that make television shows. Yeah. So of course I'll do that. Yeah. But I never thought I was going to win, and I never thought I was going to 
you know, this is going to be the best thing ever. So it was a job. Yeah. And I got to work with some beautiful people and meet some amazing comedians and make great connections, you know. Yeah. What has been the highlight of your career so far? <sighs> Puppetry career? Yeah, sure. Because, it, well, as a puppeteer, I would say, that can I have two? You can, you, uh, yes, of course. First one, making Ricketts Lane because it was the f- funnest job and I wrote, me and Sammy wrote every word of that show and we got to make it from start to finish and we spent five years getting there and we developed it and the characters was, were rich because we'd spent that long working on them. That was the, the time that we spent shooting that was the best job I've ever had in my life. But the other career highlight was working on Me and My Monsters mm-hmm. as a puppeteer because that was a Henson Workshop puppet. Um, it changed my... I was like, I'm proud of that show. Like if I watch back that, I go, wow, yeah, you were on point. You know what I mean? It's weird. It's like a, it's, I was at a good point of my performance career. And that puppet changed the way I operate Randy. Well, I was going to ask because, uh, I mean, we, we were kind of talking and I, I guess skipped a few questions, but um, Fiend was yeah. the character's name, right? That puppet is an amazing puppet, so but also cool. looks like it could be a little bit of a beast to perform. Was it heavy or was it pretty easy? He was easy? heavy. He was, yeah. he, he was heavy, but he was... Um, so small, like he's he was kind of, you know, um, he wasn't that small actually. But the other characters were quite big, right? Um, uh, you know, Haggis was a suit puppet. Don Austin was the puppeteer. He's a UK puppeteer. He was uh, he's an amazing puppeteer. He was brilliant inside that costume. But Fiend was like this little tank. He was like a little solid unit. So he had cables that ran out of his head onto this bionic arm and. It would move like if I moved. I had like a my hand was around like a a joystick kind of thing. If I moved it from left to right, his eye stalks would um would move left and right. If I rotated, if I if I moved it forward, he would like uh they would rotate side to side, and then yeah. there was a trigger to squeeze them closed. So I would squeeze closed and then rotate, and he would look angry. Or I would, you know, that's how he kind of would look surprised or angry or whatever. It was so cool. You get so many subtle movements out of it. He was he was heavy-ish, and but the thing was his height compared to all the other characters was so small that like if I walked him into a room, I had to be on a rolly, but like flat on the rolly. So I was kind of like in in kind of like a Pilates scoop position, scooting myself around on a rolly and walking him so he was just at the bottom of frame but high enough to look like he's in frame but doing that puppet thing where he's clearly not touching the ground but we believe he is so his height stuff was tricky but i loved it it was like six months i got so fit because it was just like a every time was a workout his lines were fun they added a laugh track afterwards Mm -hmm. so i don't know if you've seen it but like we shot it without thinking there was going to be a laugh track so the timing is all really nifty, but then they added a laugh track. It changed the whole thing for me. But yeah, I've just seen clips. I haven't seen. I've seen a right. lot of clips, but not a full episode. There was a lot of cupboards. Like I was inside cupboards, and you know, there were there were trenches, but they were quite low. So I was like, I spent a lot of time inside couches, and you know, the old up in the armchair thing. And, yeah. Um, Oh, that was fun. It was really fun. And I worked with a puppeteer, Alice Osborne was my, she worked with me on that puppet. She did the arms and his little tail and he had glove feet so we could make his little feet <laughs> walk and stuff. Yeah. I love that so much. And that puppet, I want that puppet. <laughs> like there is a version of that puppet somewhere. There was a, a Henson exhibition somewhere. Apparently someone took a photo of it. There's like he, the stunt version of that puppet is in a glass case somewhere. But the original, I reckon, is in a container in, in a box somewhere in the UK, just rotting. I hate that. Yeah, I wanted to use that character to talk to kids on the street and stuff. He was such a cool character. Yeah, fiend, what a legend. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, career highlight. Well, if people want to connect with you online, where can they go? They can go to heathmckiver dot com, and there's a there's a um, there's like an email address you can. <laughs> Send me an email. What do you mean? Like I don't have well, any, no, yeah, I, not, don't, well, I don't have social media with my face or my name on it. But Randy does. Randy if they does. follow Randy. Yeah, Randy Feltface. Yeah. yeah, Randy's got an Instagram account that I that I use a lot. So all of my gigs I'll put on there. Um, he has a Facebook page, Randy Feltface. 
Um, there's a Twitter account where I'm writing my Twitter manifesto <laughs> in reverse order, yeah. which is about to kick off. I'm going to start doing that. I was going to do it one word at a time, but I wrote the manifesto and it's longer than a year. <laughs> so I've, I'm going to do it in, in like sections. But yeah, um, find me on that stuff. Follow Randy. Don't talk to me if you see me on the street <laughs> and everything will be fine. <laughs> well, he, no, I'm very approachable. <laughs> I can't thank you enough for being on the show. This has been a real treat. It's thank you so for having awesome. me. I want to know more about you. We have to do I'm going to start a podcast so I can interview you. <laughs> All right. I'm looking forward to being on it. Many thanks to Heath McIver for taking the time to talk to me for this episode. For links to Heath's website and some of the other things we discussed, please visit the post for this episode, episode number 34, over at underthepuppet.com. And if you'd like to hear even more of my conversation with Heath, where he started interviewing me, it is available as bonus content for this episode on the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. For more information, visit underthepuppet.com and look for the app links in the header. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I welcome your feedback via email at hello at saturdaymorningmedia.com or via Twitter, where you can find the show at username Under the Puppet. You can also follow the show on Instagram at Under the Puppet or Facebook, where you can find the show's page by searching for Under the Puppet. I want to hear your suggestions for questions I should be asking and for future guests. Let me know who I should be talking to. Thank you so much for listening. Talk to you next time right here on Under the Puppet. This episode of Under the Puppet featured music by Dan Ring and was edited by Stephen Staver. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly pledge for as little as a dollar a month. Patrons get new episodes before they are released, behind-the-scenes information, and exclusive bonus content. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly pledge today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Under the Puppet is copyright 2019 Saturday Morning Media Grant Pachoco Executive Producer. All rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.